which is uh, Ian Phillips for ARM. Uh, there's one thing on this slide which uh, is uh, very true, the opinions uh, expressed will be as old. Um, I'm going to go off slide a little bit to start with because already I, I find that there is a, a feeling going on here about uh, ICT and one of the big problems that we face is this business of uh, knowing what we're talking about. And ICT, I heard our previous speaker, Redl, talking about um, needing somebody to run your IT systems. And this is one of the big misunderstandings about ICT jobs. ICT is a little bit like talking about a hospital. There are a lot of different jobs in a hospital, including the people who serve cups of tea and, and hand out food, but there are also specialists and consultants. And the same applies in the ICT domain. And we must get this right. We're not talking about one skill set for the whole thing. And we're not talking about the same class of people. And that, that's not said unkindly for all of the jobs which are taken in that opportunity. And some people are not going to be appropriate for all of the jobs, no matter how much you propose to retrain them. So, moving on a little bit then. I've seen some horrific figures which show just how short the, uh, this ICT sector is going to be. Uh, I've seen a figure which up to 2 billion, uh, and I just frankly don't believe it. Um, these are numbers which are aimed at terrifying, but they are also way too big numbers to be resolved by any organic uh, growth approach. And what you have to remember here is that businesses are not static things, and neither is ICT. People have already faced huge amounts of growth. The size of an integrated circuit, for example, in the last 20 years, that's the time since ARM has been formed, has grown by 20,000 times. 20,000 times. I say it again. That's just the integrated circuit. A system these days has far more software in it than it used to have. So your electronic product, which we all love, has so much more software in there these days that the design challenge is not just 20,000 times bigger, but 20,000 plus times bigger because of the other things which are involved in it. Yet, these products are being produced by teams which are broadly the same size as they were 20 years ago. That's productivity efficiency. It doesn't show a great deal on the outside, but what you are actually seeing is engineers have been working on improving their methodology, not just on giving you smarter products. And so there are, there are roles in there which will have huge impact on the shortages of engineers because businesses have to be in existence. They have to exist. So they can't say, we've not got enough engineers. Oh dear, what shall we do? They say, we've not got enough engineers. How are we going to produce our product with the engineers that we've got? And they do something about it. So these are, these are aspects of engineering which are perhaps not, not appre appreciated. I think that there is a shortage of engineers, to pick up on Khalil's earlier comment, but the number is just a shortage as far as I'm concerned at the moment. We're going to do something about it. And I think that if Europe is capable of doing something about it better than other countries in the world, then we stand a chance of keeping engineers here, attracting engineers here, and, uh, and establishing an environment that they will want to stay here. There's no reason for us not to improve our engineering uh, environments because to do so would simply be negligent. Now we all know about these products, uh, our electronic systems or should we call them uh, uh, embedded devices or should we call them cyber physical systems. We can't even make up our mind what we call them and so how can we possibly be conveying any kind of message about what's involved in doing them because we, we don't know ourselves. And these are only the ones that we know about. Our cameras, our engine management systems, our phones. These are the electronic systems that are part of our lives and we consider them an important part of our lives. We don't see the ones which are in the ecosystem, the ones that are keeping the logistics, the, uh, the food on the, on the shelves in the supermarkets. We don't see the transport ones that are helping to stop our planes colliding with one another. And all of those other activities those are also important parts for the, and roles for the, for the electronic systems. But they are important in a different way to these. You could actually live without these. You couldn't live without the other ones. Our economies and our lifestyle depend on those other electronic systems. And these are electronic systems which are already important today. They're going to be even more important in the future because they will develop out from this uh, community who are using them today into the communities which are not using them today. So increasingly every aspect of our lives will depend 
on electronic systems. And that's an important thing for us to worry about because if we depend on it, if our nation depends on it, if our lives depend on it, then sure as hell, excuse me, our governments should be making sure that we are well represented in that area because we can't trust that to other people to provide. Now how well are our achievements speaking for us? Because surely everybody realizes that we're involved in these things. I mean this is a, a report that was done by Engineering UK back in 2011 and I thought it's very significant. Um, they, they did surveys and they do surveys from time to time in different areas. This is a particular one that they did in this year. And they asked people whether they consider that engineers would play an important part in climate change, uh, in, in overcoming or managing the consequences of climate change. And not surprisingly, they found 92% of men and 84% of women said that they thought that engineers would play an important role. So, I mean, this is a good sign, isn't it? Well, it was good until you read the, the bot bottom part. Because those same people were also asked what things engineers had done in the last 50 years which was important to their lives. And generally speaking around 50% of people couldn't think of anything that we'd actually done. Now that is desperate from my point of view. They have no idea. They know what engineers do. Well we're kind of out there somewhere doing stuff and we know that it's going to be important to climate change but actually I can't think of anything that they've done recently. Um, now, okay, the world's kind of different these days, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful that we're able to do things like take a stone, take it apart, atom by atom, reassemble it into a phone? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it magic? Well, actually, it's wonderful, but it's not magic. And I think this is a problem because it's the pinnacle of our achievement, of mankind's achievement, to enable us to manipulate individual atoms and the electrons that go around them. This is absolutely stunning stuff. It's the achievement of standing on the shoulders of giants. And it's what, we, what has come from this. Now that is what the, uh, let's say, ICT, I'm going to call it electronic systems. That's what the electronic systems people are involved in doing. How can we fail to make it exciting to tell people that that's what we're doing? And yet we are. But though it's not, although it's very clever, it's not actually magic. Uh, it's ingenious, precise, exciting, laborious, and it's evolving. It's hugely different yesterday than it was today, than it is today, and it'll be hugely different tomorrow. That evolutionary aspect of it is important when we start to think in terms of how we're going to educate people for this, because it's not static. A side effect, though, is if it's, in, if it's sufficiently advanced technology that it's indistinguishable from magic, that makes us all indistinguishable from magicians. So the people out there just think of us as magicians. They have no idea what we do. They just think we go abracadabra and it happens. So we don't have to learn to do anything and it's not precise and we, there's no skill involved in it. You just get your magic wand out and say, I think we'll have a smartphone and we'll have it like this. Or I think we'll have an engine management unit, we'll have it like that. You know, these are our cameras. They all come about because magic is a wonderful thing, isn't it? We have to tell people about this. It's important. So everybody has a threshold of magic though. You have a threshold of magic even if you're working in this area because there are other things that you don't know about. I mean, we don't know about biological systems, do we really? We're very, very clever, but there is nobody, no scientist, no engineer in the world who can grow a blade of grass without having a grass seed or an oak tree without an acorn. You know, we're very clever, but we know we have limitations. Society doesn't know that. Society in general considers that that's magic and what we do is magic as well. So we are obviously capable of doing things like managing life, managing cancer, managing economic systems, as well as we're able to produce electronic systems. Yeah, we know that's not true. One of them is beyond our knowledge, the other one is the result of clever activities, but it's not beyond it. So to put some scale on this, the threshold of magic for most non-scientific but well-educated people is the incandescent light bulb. It doesn't extend to the new um, uh, high energy efficiency light bulbs. The incandescent light bulb is something that people can get their head around. But we will all lose if we fail to explain the difference between magic and science though, to the public. Our roles will not be recognized or valued. Teaching and research will go, tech jobs will follow, and our society will become dependent on others. How important, 
has this got to be? It is very, very important. So our technologies are not speaking for us. So if they don't speak for us, unless society recognises what we do, people will not direct their kids in this direction. Kids will not see it as an interesting challenge or a lucrative opportunity. Unless politicians value our contribution and understand it, then they won't value our contribution to the economy. Um, in, in, interestingly, there was a, a group in uh, the UK called ESCO, Electronic Systems Capabilities and Opportunities, and they quantified what was previously an invisible community in the UK, i.e. as far as the politicians were concerned, had zero economic contribution, as being 855,000 people employed and 5.4% of the economy, just by looking at it in a way which, was, which would enable it to be, uh, to be quantified. And until we understand, and that's where I point the finger back at us, what we do, then we will never explain it to other people either. Because we all know what we do, but we don't know it in a way which we can explain it to our kids and our wives or husbands. Most people in this area, and I am no ex exception to that, have never been able to explain to my wife what I do for a living. She still thinks I just go out on swanning, swanning off activities to Europe to, uh, to do things like this. She doesn't understand it. She's, she's very smart. She's a teacher in English and history, not science. But we have to do this education ourselves. We are the people who understand what we do and what our roles are and so on. And we have been failing to communicate that to society. It's our responsibility. It will not happen without us. We've sat back for too long, now it's our responsibility. Now, to be an engineer or a scientist is a journey of a lifetime. You can't become an engineer and scientist overnight, not even in four or five years. It's a lifetime activity, and that means you have to continue working at it. Tertiary education, predominantly electrical engineering, computer science, maths and physics, gets you to the starting gate in this game. It enables you to understand the language and the content, and it prepares you to take the next steps in your education. Your education is not just a formal process, incidentally, because businesses are interested in what you can do, not what you, can say, not what you say you can do, or indeed what somebody else says you can do. It's what you can do that matters. And they are not overly worried about the certificates that you've got, as long as you can do the job. And they also know that the last three to five years of what you've been working on is what really defines what you currently are. So it's a continuous process and we have to remember that. So the majority of the engineer scientist training is actually through life. And a lot of it, as somebody else said earlier, is just in time. We don't need people to have the skills for when the business eventually evolves to need them. We need people to have the skills now, because this is what the, we're trying to tackle now. Business opportunities are capability-based. The capabilities of the business determine the products that they can make. And skilled engineers and scientists are an important part of that capability. And these are skills which will never be put into the tools. These are, put, these are skills which are always there in the brain. And it's the difference between effectively an engineer scientist role and a technician role, and it's well to remember that. Because a good engineer and scientist connects their knowledge and the knowledge of their community and their experience to deliver innovation. And the innovation is not just putting things together in the same old way, but putting things together in a clever way, an innovative way, to get some difference out of it that you would otherwise get from the technology on its own. <coughs> Governments and providers must recognize then that the continuous training of engineers and scientists throughout their life is an important role. It's not just that first degree. It also means that the first degree engineers have got to come out with adaptability and learning to learn skills because they, that's a part, an important part of what they're going to have to do when they get out there. In fact, most engineers, when they go into their engineering roles, are not expected to be able to do the job. Now, that's an interesting perspective. They're expected to learn to be able to do the job pretty quick. Mostly it takes six months before an engineer is doing basic stuff inside a new career, and up to two years before they're leading things. 
that's a part of the training and it may be on the job training it may be supported by uh, by internet activities other people's experiences and so on and so forth but that's the reality of being an engineer in the uh, electronic systems domain now I don't apologize for this because it is a statement of truth engineering and science engineers and scientists are somewhat elite if you are, if you work on the basis of pure numbers that's an inevitable consequence from this. It's only around 3% of the population that has an engineering degree and only half of this number are actually employed in, engin in engineering and scientific um, roles. That's about one person per class in secondary education. It's no wonder that girls find it difficult. It's bad enough being the only geek in the class when you're a man it's even worse when you're a, a woman and a geek in the class okay so this is why and part of the reason that we have a problem uh, only around one percent of that number will be world-class leaders so an awful lot of them even though they're still going to be good they've got good career prospects and all the rest of it those people have got a job and they've got a reasonably well-paid job but if they're going to be world leaders you're probably talking of around one percent of that number it's a very small num it's a very small percentage around 0.03% of the world population we could double that number treble that number by encouraging people to to be elite and it's not we've got to find a way of saying this so it's not intended to be offensive because it's not intended to be offensive because the benefit of doubling and trebling those numbers on Europe's economy is very significant you've got the drivers and the motivation force here and if you've got the, the sort of population the sort of environment where those people like to work and can see that they have a future and they can see that they can develop then that environment will give us a much greater spin out into the rest of the economy as well so conclusions very quickly um, there is a basic two-pronged approach that, I, that I'm identifying here educate society about our roles and assure the through life education requirement the third one I have to be a little bit more cautious about and that is to encourage intellectual elitism it's not a politically acceptable topic but it's important and I think we have to remember that and finally just to make a note this is not to say that any of the other educational initiatives in particular the improvement of STEM and computer science educations in school are not necessary they are all necessary but I hear people talking about those so those are activities which are underway I see that the two-pronged approach that I've got above is important and is not being recognized and so I'm talking about that today so thank you very much for listening